Hi. Hi, yeah, it's 4 o'clock. Most of you are tired, just like me. You're sitting there going, really, I have to go to class at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The good news is we're not in traffic. Yay. <laughs> All right, so this is human physiology. Uh, hopefully you're in the right place. Hopefully I'm in the right place. I'm Dr. Wayne. Uh, my office is SR2-221G. That is in the small brown building just above the UC Underground where Taco Bell and Chick-fil-A is. Some people call it the pharmacy building. It's not the pharmacy building, it's SR2. I'm on the second floor, my office is 221G. You can come by and see me during my office hours, which are Tuesdays and Thursdays, 12.30 to 2 o'clock. That says 12 to 2, whatever. I'm, you'll usually find me with food in my mouth regardless. Um, you can call me, my number is 743-9246. If I pick up the phone, I'm happy to talk to you. If I don't pick up the phone, you get the voicemail, just go ahead and hang up the phone right there because I don't check my voicemail, all right? I have six years of voicemail sitting, and I'm not even going to bother deleting. I'm just going to let that box fill up, and maybe it just crashes the servers or something. Uh, the reason for this is because usually people will call me, you know, with an emergency on a Saturday night, like at 2 o'clock, thinking for some strange reason I'm in my office, and I can solve their problem. No. And usually by the time I get the voicemail, I learned this my first semester, it's been two days, you've already figured out the problem, and now I look like the idiot. So what's easier to do is if you need to get in touch with me or you have a question and I don't answer my phone, just send me an email. I'm usually pretty good at getting back to you as soon as I see the email. Sometimes I might be looking at something else and it might be 30 minutes or if I'm in class it might be an hour and a half till you get a response or if it's the weekend, yes, you have to wait two days. I'm not going to check my work email at home. So, uh, but I will get back to you as quick as I can to respond. So that's how you get in touch with me. Um, we're going to be going, yeah, I have to apologize. Today's one of those days where you think you're getting out in like 15 minutes. Yeah, we go the whole day. So, sorry. Uh, let me just see. There we go. Uh, this is our textbook. Now, you'll see up there it says recommended textbook, and it's true. It's recommended. But let me ask a question. You can just do this by raising of your hands. How many of you guys are planning on some sort of professional school? Like, yeah, look around the room. See, most of you. You know, it doesn't matter what the professional school is, but most of you are planning on some sort of medical profession. Very few people planning on law school come through this class. Every now and then we get one, but for the most part you guys are planning on some sort of medical profession. And usually you will end up with another physiology class, and yeah, they probably is a little bit more advanced, but if you want a textbook to help guide you through your professional school, this textbook is actually good enough to do so. It's actually written by a uh, professor at a nursing school, and they use it there. But... Um, I do recommend it. Now, we're in the sixth edition. Last year, they were in the fifth edition. You'll notice over here, I say other textbooks are acceptable. If you are looking for a textbook and you need a resource, not a lot has changed in terms of physiology over the last couple of years. Every now and then, there'll be something new. And surprisingly enough, in this sixth edition, there is actually some new stuff. Now, is it enough to go, I must have this book? Mm, that's up to you. But it is a very good textbook. I've actually reviewed it. Um, I've gone through it uh, with fine-tooth comb, and I was actually impressed by it relative to other upgrades that you usually see. It's like, oh, good, they've made more modern pictures. Yay. So you can get it at the bookstore, or you can, uh, uh, you can uh, order it online. You can go through wherever, wherever you want to to get it. If you do go with an older textbook, uh, you need to be able to think about Mastering A&P, which is bundled with this textbook. And I'm going to talk about Mastering A&P in just a moment. If you do plan on buying this new, I got this in the mail yesterday morning. So you can go to the Pearson store, which is always cheaper than our bookstore. I bet you didn't know this. Well, you probably know this because you've paid for it. But when you go to the bookstore, they mark up your books 40% for whatever they charged you. And so it's going to be cheaper just by doing that. And then, of course, you have another discount. So just pointing this out, if, if that's the way you want to go, you know, great. I do recommend a textbook. I recommend this one because that's the one I typically follow. Now, if you have a cell phone, you know, put it on buzzer, vibrate, whatever. No one cares to hear your uh, ringtone except for you. Um, if you heard my ringtone, you'd just think, God, what a geek. And so 
we think the same thing about you when your cell phone goes off. You, you know, uh, just put it on silent mode, keep it in your pocket, make you happy. The stuff you actually care about is exam dates. About once a month, we'll have an exam September 18th, October 16th, November 13th, and December 18th is our final. For some reason, that doesn't seem right, but I'm just going to go ahead and just trust that it's up there. If there's a change, I'll make an announcement. Uh, all my exams are 50 questions. These are multiple guess type questions with some true-false in there to speed these things up. I do throw in K-type questions, which are the multiple, multiple guesses, you know, the A plus B, the A plus B plus C, not D, but A and maybe E type questions. I don't do a lot of those, but there's a reason for that. And that's because all of you are planning, or not all of you, many of you are planning on professional schools, and that's all you're going to see for the rest of your life. So you might as well get used to it now, torture yourself, figure out if this is really something you want to do, and then after you make the decision of no, you can go off to go to law school. All my exams are 100 points each. I take the average of all four exams. Everyone repeat after me. I do not drop tests. No tests are dropped. No tests are dropped. Yay, I'm not going to get an email this semester. I, maybe one. Yeah, everyone always, I, I, say, I say this every year. I don't drop tests. There's a reason for that. If you spend a minute studying for my exams, that's valuable time you spent for me to prepare for one of my exams. So if you even took the exam by studying, I'm wasting, or I shouldn't say wasting, I'm using your time. And would you say that your time is valuable? Would you rather be doing something else than studying for my exams? I, I should hope so. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad that you're studying for my exam because you want to learn something and you want to prove to me that you learned it. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are many things in this world we'd rather be doing than studying. And I can prove this to you because think about your study habits and your study time. Do you sit down and study straight or do you figure out ways to avoid studying? For example, cleaning your room, going to the bathroom, and cleaning the bathroom. <laughs> cleaning the kitchen. You know, trying to find, oh, I got to mow the lawn. I don't own a lawn, but I'm going to go mow it. <laughs> you find anything to do other than study. So there are obviously things you'd rather be doing than studying. So if you spend a moment of time studying for one of my exams, that's valuable time. And if I'm taking your exam and throwing it away, what am I saying about your time? It's not worth anything. And I'm not going to say that about your time. If you're doing something for me, it's going to count. So don't throw it away. All right. Anyway, my exams are non-cumulative, so that should take a little bit of burden off you. But you should kind of realize that by now. And I know that a lot of biology professors don't think this way, but let's face it. Biology is a cumulative discipline. The stuff you learn at the beginning of the semester is, is applicable at the end of the semester. There's no point in me asking, did you understand this? Because you're not going to understand this if you didn't understand that. Does that make sense? When you take calculus, do they put addition and subtraction problems on the exams in the final? No, it's calculus, right? Because you have to know how to add and subtract before you can do algebra, before you can do trig, before you can do calc, and non-Euclidean geometry. So that's how I treat this. Everything that we're going to learn at the beginning is necessary to understand the stuff that's going on at the end. So there's no point in me asking you this again. You'll prove to me that you don't know it by not being able to answer those questions if you didn't learn this stuff down here. So that should be a relief. The good news is this stuff is really, really easy. Physiology is an easy class. It's just a matter of getting over the language barrier. Once you get over the language barrier, everything is a piece of cake. Now, all our exams are going to be done through CASA. Yay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. So most of you know about CASA. For those of you who don't know about CASA, you need to go to this website and register. Everyone in here more or less got my email spam the last two weeks, right? Yeah, you, you were just looking forward to those, I could tell. I mean, this is how bad it was. When our server labels it as spam when I'm sending it to you, and did you notice that it was labeled spam? I didn't put that on there. That was our server. That was it. Oh, yeah, he keeps sending these things out. This must be a bot. And not a doctor bot, just. <laughs> so, anyway, for those of you who don't know, have never done costs, what you need to do, you need to go to this website and register. And basically, they already know that you're in my class. They just need to have you get access to their servers. And what you're going to do is you're going to be able to sign up for exams uh, specifically on the dates that we have them assigned. On those dates that we have exams at CASA, 
No class. All right, so don't show up here at 4 o'clock on an exam day. You'll be very, very, very lonely. I will hope that you've already taken your exam and you're now at happy hour. <laughs> but I know how you guys think, and so you think that if you wait till the 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock exam, you'll have all day to study. It's a lie. Anyway, these are, this is basically to show you how you can go to CASA. Really, you go to the website. You can sign up for an exam about two weeks before. Uh, it's exactly two weeks before the exam date. And really, for those of you who don't know, two weeks before means midnight, 14 days before the exam. And I can guarantee you 225 people will be sitting there for that clock waiting to go from 11.59 to 12. All right? If you want the time you want, be one of those 225 people. All right. If you don't get your time slot, I can't guarantee anything. You can't email me, and I can't get you anything. CASA is run by the math department, which explains a lot. <laughs> That's why they're very rigid. Okay. <laughs> If you don't get in the time slot, that's going to be a problem. So you have to really kind of plan ahead. If you have three classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and please tell me you don't have two or three classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, make sure that you adjust your schedule so that you can fit things. And guys, like I said, the 6 o'clock time slot does not guarantee that you're going to study all day. What that means is you're going to wake up panicking, and you're going to complain about studying all day. So just get it done. You know, If you know that you're a procrastinator, okay, fine. But if you know that you can get things done, I'm telling you, you can have the rest of the day off. You don't have to worry about anything. Now, how many of you guys are from Houston or lived in Houston at least two or three years? All right. So we don't have any real noobs here. All right. What is one of the best features about Houston? Traffic. See, I don't even have to ask the question. I mean, we know. It's traffic. All right. We know the rule. On days of exams, is traffic going to move smoothly? No. Is there, is there going to be a seven-car pileup between you and school? Are your tires going to blow? Yes. Whatever can go wrong, Murphy's Law will on the day of exam. So you need to plan ahead. It says up here, show up at least 30 minutes before the exam. That's if something was good. All right. If nothing else happened, please be there at least 30 minutes early. That way, there's you don't have to deal with any problems that CASA might be having. You never know how many people are going to be in line. And I've had people complain, saying I was in line and I got up there and they said, "Sorry, your time is was a minute ago." So be sure that you're there 30 minutes ahead of time, and then just keep in mind that you have to keep traffic in mind as well. So if you have a test at 11:30, make sure you show up at school at like eight, <laughs> and you'll get here about 11. So if you do that, you're going to be okay. So just keep all that stuff in mind. Remember, there are no wait lists at CASA. If you miss your time, you have to hope that there is another time available. And keep in mind, your fellow students are all trying to get the latest time as possible. So the longer you wait, the harder it is to get those later times. So your failure to plan is your problem. Sort of. All right. When you take your exams, I expect A's. Never had a full semester of A's. I will kill for a full semester. I won't kill, but we will have a party if we have all A's. A good one. <laughs> a police are coming party. <laughs> yes, sir. You have exactly one hour, and that sounds panicky, but I want you to tell you what the average is for a person to finish an exam, 40 to 45 minutes. So that's, that's historically the average over the last six years. So it feels like, oh, my God, i got 60 minutes to do 50 questions. That's like a minute a question plus some change. Yeah, you'll be done long before then. I think the record on one of my exams was eight minutes. Do not do eight minutes. <laughs> All right. If you have questions about this, you can email me. But really, there's a fact that's posted on the, uh, the CASA website. There's also a fact posted on VNet, which you've, I've told you about, but which we're going to go over here in just a moment. Uh, actually, I think, no, oh, nope. Uh, just some important policy points, just in case you haven't learned this in another class by now, because I know we're really reaching the last day of classes for everybody. So you know when your drop and add dates are. Last day to drop a class with no grade is uh, this 12th of September. The last day to drop a class with a W is November 2nd. That means you will have two exams, and you have to make a decision by then. Of course, if you're doing well in the class, 
You don't need to worry. In terms of academic honesty, don't lie, cheat, or steal. That's basically what all that website talks about. I mean, that should be kind of a general policy you live by as a rule. You don't expect the world to be happy with bad things to happen. If you have a disability, the university wants to take care of you. You can go to CSD, Center for Students with Disabilities. Uh, contact them. They can help you with all sorts of different types of disabilities. Uh, obviously, you're not going to write all of this stuff down, so the best thing to do is just know that on the front page of the UHVH web website, we have a search engine. Just type in your uh, keywords, and usually the stuff will pop up within the first three. That's how I found all this stuff. So use your search engine. All right. Now, all my information for this class is this. This will be the last year of VNet. All right. Now you're going to have to suffer through Blackboard and all its nightmares. Okay, Blackboard has taken over the university. All right, but I'm still one of the last holdouts. I think the only reason we have VNet now is because I'm the one desperately holding on. I like VNet. All right, <laughs> there you're going to find anything that I'm going to give you. So the syllabus online, your policy for the class can be found online. All my PowerPoint lectures, everything that I say in class will be found online, including videos of the lectures. All right. I record all my lectures. Sometimes I fail to actually save them like I did yesterday or some other technical problem will happen. But because I've been teaching this class for so long, I have multiple semesters posted so you can go back and listen to old lectures if I somehow screw things up. Any other fact, any other document that I want to give you or you want to have access to will be put on VNet. Uh, sometimes I make announcements and put them there as well. So VNet is kind of like where we can get everything we need to go. I don't think anyone in this class doesn't have access to VNet at this point, but if you don't have access yet, you can go to the website and register if you've never done so for another class. Get your user ID and password. Email me your PeopleSoft ID and your user ID. I don't want your password, and I can get you set up so that you can see everything that's in our class. Now, again, I say that with tongue-in-cheek because I think earlier today VNet went down just by the sheer number of people trying to access it, and that happened again yesterday. That's going to kind of shake itself out over the next couple of days. Um, but also, just recognize that there are some technical problems I have no control over. But if you do have problems accessing and you know that you're registered and you know that it works, and uh, what you can do is you can contact VNet, and they're usually pretty quick to solve whatever, the, whatever problems that you might have. All right. So pretty simple. They're actually, also, if you want to actually go meet them face to face, they're in SR1. That's the big brown ugly building. Um, and they're up on the second floor right next to the dean's office. So that's their contact information if you need them. Now, I mentioned homework. This is actually done by popular demand. Uh, I actually had students coming to me, not just the best students. I'm talking multiple students saying, you know, we really want some other practice problems. We want practice problems. Can you write up some practice problems? And I'm far too lazy to do that. And I realized, you know what, this product right here, Mastering AMP, comes with the textbook. And I started looking at it, and I said, wow, I wonder if this works. And so I did a blind study with the students. I offered it as extra credit. And I said, go and do the homework, and let's see how it works. And I came up with a model of what you're going to see here. And what it turned out was that students who did the Mastering AMP homework scored about 15 to 20 points higher than the students who didn't. I said, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if this really works. And I did it again. Another blind study, another class. Sure enough, same thing. So I'm actually saying, do the homework. Now, it's still extra credit. It doesn't count against you. If you don't do it, I'm not going to punish you. But I'm telling you now, if you want to do well in the class or better than you normally would, do the homework. It's amazing. I was actually shocked. And this is what happens. If you get 50% or more on the homework, I will assign you a point for every 10% above 50%. So if you get 50%, you get one point, 60%, two points, so on and so forth. And I take those points and I add them to your test. So... If you get a 70 on the test and you did your, all your homework and you did greater than 90%, how many points do you now have on your test? 75. That's a half a letter grade. All right. Now, what did I tell you also about doing the homework? What does it give you? About 20 point, you know, 15 to 20 points on average. So if you had a 70 and you do 50% better than you normally would, 15% better, you're now looking at an 85 and you're plus 5 points. You're now looking at a 90. Hmm. Let me answer here and then we'll go over here. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. So hold that question and say he's gonna he's gonna answer that question. Yeah. Well, I I don't do the hundred percentile. So at the ninetieth percentile, that's the max. So five 
50 is 1, 60, 70, 80, 90, and then 100 is just good for you. Let <laughs> me go over here and then I'll come here. Yes. Yeah, that's right. We'll get. Yes. That's, that's correct. Perfect. Yes. So the way this works is that each of these homework assignments cover the whole unit. So that means there's about 100 to 200 questions, which if you think about it, in one shot is a lot of questions, but if you're following along with the lectures, it's about 20 questions. And the whole point here is to kind of keep you up with the lectures and learning the information as you go along to see, did I really get what was, what was being talked about? Now, you could do it the night before. And actually, I've actually moved the deadline. The deadline is now 9 o'clock in the morning instead of midnight, which is what I used to do. So for those of you who like to stay up studying, you know, that those perfect hours between 2 and 6 a.m., <laughs> you know, you're still able to do this stuff. But there, there's enough here that it's going to push you. I think, it, I think if you sit down and just did it straight, it's something like four, four and a half hours straight. And that's, of course, if you're trying really to get that perfect score. Um, thing is, you can purchase an access code if you're not buying the textbook. You can purchase it separately. You just go to that website and notice what it is. Mastering A, A, N, you know, it's the two A's, and P.com. Our, our course ID is our class ID plus the semester. So there's our class ID. That's our semester. Do not buy a used copy. All right, there's a reason for that. A used copy has one year lifespan on it. So if someone's selling you a used copy, Chances are you're not going to get access. Second thing, it's actually tied to a person. It's not tied to just anything. So I will never see your name. I will never see your name in my grade book. I will see your. You will have to input your own PeopleSoft ID in there, but I'll never know what's going on. I'll see two a number and a name that don't match and don't make any sense, and so I throw it all out. So if you're going to do this, don't buy a used copy. Buy a brand new one. And I recommend going to the website. Unless you know, unless you have a friend who'd never opened theirs and never used the code or anything like that, you know, do not buy. You're being robbed. And I've actually seen people buying stuff through eBay. So, oh, I'm going to buy this code for ten dollars. Yeah, it was used. Sorry, doesn't work. All right, I'm a member of Profs with Pride. This is uh, something that Dr. Bot does, and what this does, it tries to give you all the interesting stuff that's going on in the university. You can go to this website if you wanted to do that. But what I try to do is, so Dr. Bot actually sends me a big giant PowerPoint listing all the different things that's going on during this week. Um, and so I try to post that on VNet. So if you're really bored or need to find something to do, like, you know, you don't want to, you want to take a date someplace, but you don't want to spend any money, um, <laughs> this will have a list of stuff to do. Because you actually pay for a lot of things that you don't use, right? That's what your student fees are, you know, that big giant check that you write and you go, why do I have to pay this much for student fees? You know, well, part of that is those are your 50 copies that you can do at the library. Did you know you got to do 50 copies at the library? Yeah, you've already paid for those. So just if you want to go take a picture of Derriere and just sit there, here's my 50 copies. You can do that. But this will have a list. And uh, trust me, this is great towards the end of the semester when you start running out of money and you really need to get out and do stuff. So, um, but you can go on, I basically you can go on VNet and see the, uh, post. And I try to do it every week. Sometimes I forget. Um, lastly, before I actually start up on my standard talk on how to study, uh, HPS, uh, Ally Health Professions, asked me to uh, point out that there is a first general meeting today, right after this class in the Houston room. So after this, you can go and get a free meal and find out what HPS is all about. So, um, so there you go. Now, before I go on, why don't I try to answer the question that I was asked, do I curve? See, I didn't forget. All right. Let me preface all this saying I hate curves. And you should too. Why should you hate curves? Because they're evil. All right. What curves do is they pit you against everybody else in the classroom. Now, do I curve? Yes. <laughs> but there's a rationale for that. All right. I try to shoot for an average. All right. For an average in the class between a 65 and a 75. Now, many of you heard that, and all of a sudden, your heart sank. Now, the first thing you need to do is you need to let go of some preconceptions. All right? The first preconception you need to let go of is grades matter. Now, they do matter, but in terms of actual numbers, that doesn't matter. 
I could put you on a 200 point grade scale and everyone could have an average of 175. Would that make you feel good? Sure, it's bigger than 100. But it wouldn't. You're right. No, it wouldn't. All right? Because you, in your mind, know that that percentage is a little bit different than, I mean, it can be calculated out as a percentage 175 out of 200. So if I'm shooting for a specific average, that means I am trying to get the average grade in this class to be in that range. And that will happen. I'm pretty good at it. Every now and then I might overshoot, in which case I have to make the next test a little bit harder. Now, the point here is what I'm really trying to do. Sorry for all of you over there who can't see what I'm writing over here. What I'm really trying to do is if you look at a grade scale from 0 to 100, is I'm really trying to figure out who my best students are. If I shoot for an average of a 65 to a 75, I'm going to see very few grades up in this high range. But if I want to make you guys feel good so that everyone can get their 85 or, you know, those high grades, then what's going to happen is I'm going to see a curve that looks like that. And what does that tell me about the best students? Can I, can I t t say anything about the best students? They're all great. <laughs> you know, it made, I made really easy tests and I made you all feel really good about yourselves, which, you know, that's fine. You're all smart. Trust me. Every one of you is smart. All right. But if I have a curve that sits over here where I'm shooting for an average between a 65 and a 75, I can determine who those very, very best students are. And that's really what I'm trying to set out here because Ultimately, I'm going to be the one that's writing these recommendation letters. Dr. Couture, come on in. Everyone, Dr. Couture is here. Let's nice see you. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, before Dr. Couture came in, you were asked the question about uh, curves, and I was trying to explain to you that I'm shooting for an average between 65 and 75 so I could distinguish the top students. That doesn't mean I'm trying to make everyone look bad. It's that I'm the one that's writing these recommendation letters, and I know everybody wants to get into school. I mean, if everyone gets hundreds, I'm, I'm going to be doing it anyway. So the idea here is just so I can separate out the cream of the cream, because you really are. One thing she didn't talk about here is that I do teach students from other schools. I bet you didn't know that. Yeah, in the summer, they come here because... You know, they think, oh, well, I can go to U of H and take an easy class. <laughs> oh, it's so fun. Anyway, so I get to teach them. And you know what? You guys are some of the smartest students I've had. So don't sell yourself short. Don't think that you guys aren't smarter than those other guys across this way. That wear blue. Yeah. But anyway, so my goal here is to... Uh, my goal here is to actually help you achieve your goals. Now, many of you have taken courses with me before. You've seen this talk before. So, yes, sir. No. No. No, 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 no. No. If everyone's getting hundreds, I'm either making the test too easy or you guys are way too smart. So I'm never going to curve down. I mean, curves should be to your advantage. They should not cause you harm. But when we have curves, that's when we're actually competing with one another, so you're trying to do better than everybody else in the class. Whereas if you don't have a curve, you have a set grade, then you know, well, if I get here, then I'm, you know, I've got whatever grade. So, but I use actually a distribution curve. I do statistics on the class. I don't just say, oh, the highest grade was a 95. I, I'm going to give everyone five points. That's stupid. Why don't I just give everyone 25 points? You know? So I do, yeah. <laughs> so, I do actual stats to determine this. Now, I give this lecture here um, every semester to every class, doesn't matter what the level is, and on how to study. And the reason I do this is because I was a lazy student and also because I got myself out of being a lazy student and I started performing at the level that everybody on the planet begged of me to do since I was probably in first grade, maybe even earlier. And the other reason I'm doing this is because for the first two years that I taught here, I spent 70% of my office hours giving this exact same speech. And it's far easier to do it once than to do it 350 times. So we're going to talk about how to actually study. Now, 
I know you're sitting here thinking, oh, I'm a junior, I'm a senior, I think I've got this figured out. Well, you probably do, but let's, let's talk about really what this is. Now, Dr. Couture was talking about graduating and being pride, prideful of your school and stuff, but I want to tell you what my mission is here at this university. It's not just teaching you physiology or anatomy or any of the other classes that I teach you all. My mission is to take over the Texas Medical Center. <laughs> what that means is, and I'm not going to go in there guns a-blazing, what that means is when I have a student of mine apply to a, one of the, any of the many programs over at the Texas Medical Center, I want that U of H applicant to be looked at and said, yes. I don't want that application to go, well, we need to bring them in, you know, those U of H students. No. No. So I'm going to try to teach you some of the tricks that it's going to take in order for you to do well, to actually perform the best, and do so in such a way that it doesn't suck up every minute of your life. Because one of the things that people lie to you about, they say, in order for you to do well, you need to spend lots and lots and lots of time studying. Right? I mean, that's one of the questions. How much time did you spend studying? And your answer is, lots. I mean, you come to my office and tell me, ask you, well, why did you do so poorly? Well, I studied a lot. Okay, but did you study well? I mean, I can study a lot and not learn a thing. And very often that's what happens to you all. And so really what we try to do here, what I'm going to try to do here, is show you how to manage your time well. Because let's face it, when we sit down and study, what we do is we really try to find ways to procrastinate and feel like we're studying. And then we probably spend maybe 30, 45 minutes in a probably an eight-hour period. And if you're going to spend eight hours sitting at a desk, wouldn't you actually rather be fruitful that you get an A? Or would you rather, if you're studying for 30 minutes, you know, learn everything you need to know and then use the rest of that eight-hour period that you didn't actually study, but you cleaned the bathroom, cleaned your bedroom, went under the bed to fight the dust bunnies, you know, made yourself a meal, got on Twitter, checked your Facebook account, took a break to watch a little TV, uh, go out to the store to get your Red Bull because you know you're going to be staying up late. Wouldn't you have rather used that time to actually do something fun? Yeah. I mean... Let's face it, we'd rather do other things other than study, so if we're going to study, we might as well do as much as we can, as fast as we can, get it done, so that we can go on and do something that we'd rather be doing. Now, I was a lazy student, and when I say that, I'm not exaggerating. I was a back row student. My parents were in town this week, and my mom and I were discussing this. My mother was an educator, and she asked me the question, she says, why were you such a lazy student? I don't know why we got in this conversation, I think. But she was like, why? Why were you? And I said, I don't know. And she said, I think I know. You could get away with it. Because I was a student that sat in the back row. I was the one who fell asleep in every one of the lectures. And I was the one who never cracked a book but got a B plus or an A minus. I'm that student that you hated. <laughs> right? But that was good enough for me. I mean, I knew how to game the system well enough to say, all right, well, that's good enough. Look, look what I can do. I'm smart. I know I'm smart. Look, I can do this without trying. Well, why don't you get the A? Because it requires effort. And then I got to graduate school. All right, In graduate school, the very first biochem class, I, I mean, I remember this to this day. I, the professor walked in, and he's, you know, he's a real nice guy, and he put his coffee cup down, and then the TA came in behind him. And when I say came in behind him, you remember, keep in mind, at graduate school you have like 40 students. And they came in with this cart, wheeling in stacks of papers that were about this high. And then they started passing out the stacks to the individuals. So each stack was for each person in the class. And they said, this is what you're going to need to know for the first exam. And I looked at that and said, I don't know if I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I thought I was screwed. I really did. I was just like, oh, man. And then I remembered, you know what? Everyone's been knowing at the dawn of time that there's a way to go about studying you know, I mean, talk, I mean, you know, you got those gunner parents who are the ones that make you go to all these classes and learn how to study. Yeah, you pick up stuff, but you just don't apply it. So I'm going to try to give you the information, and I hope you apply it. So really, the big secret behind studying is time management. In all honesty, this is the big picture right here. A lot of us like to wait to the last minute because we don't like to study. Well, don't. Don't wait to the last minute. If you wait to the last minute, you're going to find out something about yourself that everyone already kind of knows, but we just kind of lie to ourselves. 
What we have here on the graph over here on the right-hand side is what was based upon a study. Now, this isn't actually from the study because I don't know where it is, but I remember being shown this. And what this is was they took a, a bunch of med students, they broke them up into two groups, and they said, okay, groups, we're going to have a test in five days. Group A, we want you to study a little bit every night. Group B, we want you to wait till the last minute. We're just going to see how well retention works. And then they didn't tell the poor guys that they were going to actually quiz them every day to see how much they actually retained. And so the green line represents those people who constantly review just a little bit every night. We're not talking two hours of study. We're talking like 10 minutes. Review the material for like 10 minutes and, you know, be done with it. Group B, or the last minute studiers, were the ones that said, don't look at the material. Wait till last minute. We want to see how much you retain. And that's how well they performed on that last quiz. You can see how quickly the information they retained disappeared. You've heard the phrase, use it or lose it. Well, that's what's going on here. This is a use it or lose it situation. And this is what happens. When you wait to the last minute, what you're doing is, is you're forgetting every bit of information that you learn. And when you sit down to study, you're looking at it going, crap, I have to learn all this all over again. I have to serve as the professor as well as a student in the middle of the night to learn all this information. Then you go, oh, it's too much. And you're sitting there trying to teach yourself. So, how do you get around doing this? Well, first thing you could do, and I know you're not going to do this, but I'm going to have to tell you this, is before you come to class, read the book. All right? And I'm not talking read the book and take notes and highlight and come in with charts and stuff like that and spend six hours studying. No, read the book as if you're reading a magazine article. You know, you read it just to see what's going on. You know, what's the story? Because when you come into class, because you've already reviewed it, you've read it, even though you're not reading it for content, you've read it and you're like, oh, I've seen that word. That's what that meant when they were talking about this. And so all of a sudden now, you're going to start seeing that you've actually retained a little bit of information. The lecture isn't going to be seen like some foreign language. And biology is a foreign language. You notice how the words are really long and they don't make a lot of sense sometimes? Foreign language. You know? Those of you who are bilingual and trilingual, and I know, you, know you're in here, you, you've got a, a, a head up against a lot of people. For those of us who can only speak one language, except for, ¿Dónde está el baño? <laughs> you know? You know? I grew up on the border, so <laughs> I know like three phrases. You know, so this will help you to understand what's going to be going on in the lecture. Now, I know most of you aren't going to do this. And again, I'm telling you, don't spend a lot of time here. I'm not one of those professors that thinks my class is the most important thing you'll ever take in your life. In fact, I know it's not the most important thing you'll ever take in your life. You know, But give it equal amount of time if you're planning on going ahead. All right. Now, this is the thing that really works, though, because it goes to this graph. The first chance you get after class, take the notes that you took in class, and go over them. And I'm going to describe how to go about doing that in just a moment. What this means is, is you're going to take advantage of the, the repetition. The, it's fresh in my brain, and I'm going to put it down on a piece of paper so that I understand it a little bit better. Now, you are of a generation that has always had phones and electronic devices, so you are not going to understand what I'm going to describe here. Back in the day when we came across a beautiful young woman and we asked her for her phone number, we had to have a piece of paper and a pen, or at least our hand and a pen. And then what we would do if we didn't have that, we would say, can I have your number? And they'd say yes. And they'd give you a seven-digit number as opposed to a ten-digit number, thank goodness. And then you'd sit there and go, five, 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 one, two, three, four, five, 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 one, two, three, four, five, 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 one, two, three, four, five, five, five. And if you do that for about five minutes, you'll never forget that number ever again. And that's what you're doing here. If you go over your notes, the very first chance you get, that information is fresh in your mind, and you're doing that repetition to get it seared into your memory. It's going to last a little bit longer. Now, the key thing here, and this is the harder part, is the over-understudying. All right? Very often, the understudying is easy to understand. You know, it's like when you look at the information, yeah, I know it. You don't know anything. But overstudying is a danger, especially in a class like this, when you see a whole bunch of facts and a whole bunch of information, and you think every single solitary word on the page is absolutely important. And I know that you guys do this because I've seen some of your textbooks. That's where you actually color the pages with a highlighter. This is how I read. I read with my highlighter. All right? That's overstudying. What you want to do is you want to figure out 
And this is the hard part about studying. It's figure out what's important. When you come into a classroom, there is something that the professor is trying to do. There is a goal in mind. Today we're going to talk about blank. Well, there you know. That's what I'm trying to learn today. And if you walk out of the class, you should be able to say, today I learned blank. You know, now if the professor is not very good or is not a very good lecture, there is going to be time when you're going to be going, I don't know what I was supposed to learn. But you should try to figure it out. Figure out what the important topics are. And once you figure out the important topics, then figure out the subtopics and the details that allow you to understand the topic. This type of studying is what we call a top-down approach as opposed to a bottom-up approach. And many of you study from the bottom up. You learn fact, 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 and then you have no idea what those facts mean. Right? You're ready for trivial pursuit, but you're not ready for your exams. If you come this direction, you're going to see how this is connected to these three things, and these three things have these three facts attached to it. So this fact explains how this thing on the top works. Now the beauty of biology or beauty of, of anatomy or physiology is that we deal with basically two questions here. We deal with structure and function. Structure is anatomy, function is physiology. We don't do a lot of anatomy in here so it's not a bunch of memoriz memorizing anatomy but you do have to be able to kind of say oh yeah that's a heart. You know, So there is a little bit of anatomy in there. So we're going to be dealing with two basic questions. But if you look at what you're trying to do, is you're trying to organize your notes in such a way that you understand them. Each one of my lectures, and many of you have already printed this up, and you've counted up the number of slides. The number of slides for this unit is 148. It used to be 200. People complained about that, so I squished them down. Yeah, I didn't take any information out. I just squished them down which is what you're going to be doing when you are studying. Because the goal here is get away from reading your slides. 95% of the students who come in my office say, I don't understand how I didn't do well in your class. I'm an A student all the time. For some reason I'm getting C's in your class. And that's because what I tell them is you're memorizing, you're trying to memorize the information. There's far too much to memorize and you're not dealing with concepts. What you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out every single solitary fact and because you don't have an eidetic memory which means a photographic memory if you don't watch the Big Bang Theory is <laughs> that what you're doing is you are trying to memorize and the way that you're doing this is you're flipping through the slides and how many of you guys do that you take the slides you put them down and you say I'm gonna start studying and so I read the first slide flip it over I read the second and then after a while you're like what did I just read alright now there's a reason for that do you guys have fun when you study? I better hear no. I mean, if anyone here says yes, find out what they're doing. <laughs> All right? No. All right? Because when you read, your brain's not doing much. Your brain is sitting there looking at the line, I mean, looking at the word, but it's not processing the word because there's nothing there. It's very passive. And so what happens is your brain's going along, and all of a sudden it's going, ooh, look, there's a spider on the wall. <laughs> Go, spider, go. Ooh, dots. You know, it's your brain is finding, trying to find something to do. And so it's why it's wandering around the room. So you need to give your brain something to do. And the thing to give your brain something to do is when you write something down, your brain has to work and think about moving your hand. Now, your brain is far faster than your muscles are. And so when you're trying to write down a, sis, a sentence like the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, that's a really long sentence, you know, 